Good afternoon. Welcome to Cisco's uh, premier sponsored session this afternoon. Uh, session number four for us, and um, this is day one of what has turned out to be a very exciting summit so far. I want to introduce very quickly our speakers for our premier session. Lou Tucker, our CTO and VP. And VP. He'll be joined, with, uh, joined by Ken Owens, also CTO and of uh, the Clouds, Cloud Services Group. <laughs> so with that, I give you Lou and Ken and OpenStack changing the face of service delivery. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, what we want to do with this session today is really talk about what we're seeing in this kind of changing landscape and particularly how this affects um, the, what we're calling the face of service delivery, how services now are going to be delivered to users uh, on cloud platforms. And I think this is a very exciting time. I think you've seen this theme repeat itself in a lot of the other sessions that are going on here uh, in the summit this week. Um, and in fact, I think that it's, I sort of start this, this line of thinking by looking at the big disruptions that are taking place in our industry and what's making those disruptions possible. Right now, for example, if you look at uh, Uber, it's disrupting transportation, taxi systems, Airbnb, disrupting a hospitality and the hotel markets, uh, Netflix, disrupting video delivery, and Amazon, disrupting traditional retail. These are, tech these are new disruptions that are happening because of the internet and because of cloud computing. These are some of these very, uh, new companies got going very, very quickly and are serving a worldwide market because of the cloud and because of internet delivery. That kind of disruption, I think, is important for us all to understand because in many ways, the businesses that we may be a part of are going to be facing new competition from a lot of these disruptors. And so we have to be able to disrupt ourselves. And so we have to think about what is the purpose of cloud computing. Because originally, from several years ago, when Amazon really started getting going, I actually was at a startup and using a lot of Amazon services. And it was the greatest experience of my life in terms of being able to very quickly develop new applications and services. And I could scale them up and down. And all of a sudden, we started talking about this dynamic API-driven way to get resources. And this was fundamentally changing the economics of computing because I didn't have to go out and rack and stack servers. I could use somebody else's. And through APIs, I could get access to them, run them for a couple hours, and turn them off. And therefore, very much more accurately track sort of the demand curve and save an awful lot of money. And so the first thing that people started thinking about when cloud computing was the fact that it was an economic change, that you could really be much more efficient. But in fact, I think as time has progressed, we've realized that becomes secondary. It becomes very secondary to the dynamic nat nature of cloud computing. And that's when we've moved from this physical domain into the virtual domain. So now we no longer think as much about how many servers we're running or how many racks and everything else, unless you have to be a service provider. If you're an application or a service delivery application, you're thinking much more about virtual machines and about containers. And this whole new world where these things become ephemeral, you can spin them up, you can spin them down, and very quickly uh, deliver new services. And some people also talk about this in the age of kind of software-defined data centers. Uh, even traditional companies, such as Bank of America, is talking about embracing a software-defined data center. What they mean by that is that they want to be able to look at their data center and use software to manage it. Instead of having uh, system operators go out or network engineers and cable things and change everything and logging into machines and doing this, they want to be able to do this through software. That gives them faster time to market, can dramatically lower their operating costs, and they're looking then to have open systems behind this because they don't want to be locked into a single vendor for this. And services now, they want to be able to span both services they're running in their data centers and they're running perhaps somebody else's cloud at a, at a kind of a service provider. So in this model, in way, one way to think about this is in fact configuration, which used to be out of a run book. You would you know, have a system operator log into some server and make a change, document the change, go over to another system, record that change so you could have compliance and everything else. And now we've become to these kind of descriptive models expressed as code. This means that you can repeat that operation again and again and again and know that it hasn't changed. 
And this is a much, bet, much better way, and this is the heart, I think, of all of that we're, everything that we're seeing in changing service delivery, because now we have a, a way to codify exactly what composes these services and how they're supposed to operate. So software-driven infrastructure now is really possible to be based on policy. So this is what IT organizations really want to do. They're trying to enforce a certain usage model, a certain way of delivering a service based upon policy rather than the configuration that they might have, might have, uh, might have applied. So there's been a lot of talk about, and particularly coming from Cisco, where we are looking at things such as ACI, which is a way to express network policy rather than what are, what are, how you want to be able to configure each one of these network systems so that you can talk about policies around this application. Is it internet facing or is it internally facing? Is it accessible from the internet? Should there be any traffic between this point, this server, and that server? If there should never be traffic between that, that would be a violation of policy. So you want to be able to express that and codify that as policy. So there's a lot of work being done now in open source and OpenStack and in other areas around this kind of group-based policy. This affects very much the service delivery because now you can talk about very large-scale services and express those policies that you want to see happen. The other thing that I think that's happening is, is quite interesting is that as a community, we're getting together and deciding that it's better for us to work together in open source communities such as OpenStack than competing for proprietary solutions. Our customers are getting too smart. Our customers are demanding open systems. Our customers are demanding that we work together with each other. And so in the past, we've done that through consortia. We've done that through you know, getting together in standards bodies. And now they're really asking for us to get together and do it through code. So in something like OpenStack, uh, where Cisco has been involved since early 2011, we've gotten together. And in fact, the early Neutron networking service that we got together, we got together with 14 other companies, uh, many of which were our fierce competitors in the market. And we decided we needed a network service in OpenStack to be alongside of the compute service and the storage service. And so we worked together in evolving Neutron to what it is today to be able to be this kind of service that, that is vendor neutral. The customers can actually use, get OpenStack from many different places, and they have an API that they can count on, and now the vendors have to compete on the implementation. The vendors have to compete on the services they provide around that and the support they provide on that. But the actual, the actual APIs, we're not trapping our, our customers into that. And so this kind of independence from vendors is something very important. What that's also allowed is that now we have a large number of services that are, that are targeting a much larger environment. We know the, the, the giants in cloud computing today, be it Google, Amazon, Microsoft, have their own clouds. We're looking for a counterbalance to that in this open community where there can be many, many more. There can be hundreds or thousands of other cloud providers and, and clouds that are being run inside of a company's data center. In fact, that was the original um, um, impetus for developing OpenStack was to develop the software that allowed anybody to build their own cloud. They can build it in their own data center. They could build it and they could become, offer their own cloud services. So there's a lot of opportunities that are being created because we've gotten together around this community-based software. And in fact, that we've seen, and it's interesting if you go to the OpenStack.org site, uh, we have a number of case studies. And it's, I really urge you to take a look at those because now there's a wide variety of industries and use cases that are being developed in OpenStack. And you can find others that might be like your own business and why, how they're adapting OpenStack for their use. So we're seeing things not just from sort of startups and ser service providers, but also com big companies such as PayPal or Best Buy and even media companies such as Comcast or financial services companies and Bloomberg. All of these are using OpenStack for different purposes. So this uh, has been actually very rewarding to see the number of different applications that are being developed on top of OpenStack. Previously, actually, we just had a conversation about one of those new emerging verticals, I think, which is around NFV. Because we're seeing now service providers looking at a cloud platform which has open APIs and saying what we want to be able to do is start to virtualize our network services themselves. And I think this is happening because there's another kind of perfect storm that, that's developing here. Uh, several years ago, we started talking about SDN, 
software-defined networking and, and things such as OpenFlow. And now we're seeing that was happening at the same time as cloud computing is happening, and those things now are coming together and forming this kind of perfect storm where cloud computing and software-defined networking, network function virtualization is coming together at the same time and creating a whole swirl of activity around this area as service providers are seeing, here's a new way, instead of providing you know, different appliances that they would go to market with or buy from a vendor, they can start defining these things again as software services, get a speed to market, and get much more advantageous out of the rest of their infrastructure. So it was not surprising then in OpenStack itself when we defined a network service that we defined it such that it would work with many, many different pieces of uh, hardware from different vendors. And so that's why there's been a large number of plugins and drivers underneath Neutron from most of the leading uh, companies here. Also outside of OpenStack, there have been other open source initiatives around open daylight. This is where the community is getting together and again defining a software-based controller whereby this can now be used with OpenStack because this is now a software way to define a lot of the network uh, functionality that you want in the control plane directing, directing the network to the future. So this is, this is a, a, a picture that actually a number of us in, in the, in, on the foundation actually have been working on. There's a working group around uh, essentially OpenStack for the telco industry. And this is where you can see a large number of different devices that have been developed which have been hardened appliances to perform different network functions that are now being replaced by software. And each one of these things are now becoming software. That creates requirements on the OpenStack platform for we want this to be carrier grade. We want to be able to provide isolation of the resources. We want to be able to have non-interference of those resources. We need it to be much more real time. And all of these things now are creating additional requirements on the OpenStack platform that again, across the community, we're working together to bring those things about. Interesting enough that we see the European Standards Body, Etsy, then got into the picture here and started talking about publishing a spec. And here they've defined the architecture for how they want to see NFE working in terms of that we have an orchestration manager, we've got a virtual resource manager, and other things, and OpenStack plays a fundamental piece of, of, of this puzzle. In fact, another group has been started called OpenNFV, and this is a group that is developing reference implementations based on OpenStack with open daylight of this kind of an architecture. So in this architecture, we can see we've totally replaced those hardware network functions with, with virtualized services. Those virtualized services now have to be carrier grade. They have to be resilient, they have to be able to scale. And but this means that they can be much more rapidly deployed than having a truck roll bringing in new equipment or trying to expand the number, number of, of network services you can uh, previously have been done by hardware. Now you can rapidly bring those up as virtual machines. And so this whole new model has coming about where software, as Mark Andreessen sort of said, is eating hardware, replacing it in, in, in a much more agile manner. At the National Association of Broadcasters show uh, in Las Vegas, uh, several months ago, we we're beginning to see this happen now in another industry. So it's not just in the traditional web applications we saw in cloud computing or the kind of web services we had seen, not just what we've seen then in the telco market with NFE. Now we're seeing it happen in the media uh, creation and distribution. And I think this is the one that's next in line. And over the next couple of years, we'll start to see a lot of activity uh, in this space. For example, if you look at the media and what's going on in, in this uh, world today, there's a huge number of competitive pressures. We're seeing over-the-top delivery of video services. We're seeing a lot of consolidation in the industry. We're seeing multi-screen um, uh, implementations taking place. We're getting our video and our, and, our, and our things on many different devices. So I want to be able to watch something on TV from, from a cable box. I want to be able to get it on my phone and be able to get it wherever I am in the world. All of these things are creating tremendous pressures and tremendous need for these uh, industries to adapt, and therefore they're turning to cloud computing for this purpose as well. In fact, traditionally what we've been seeing has been moving from video-based delivery services and these big switches uh, with a serial digital interface, turning to now IP networks. And so this is a big change, because traditionally IP was not very good at this. You needed to be able to have the delivery of video without dropping any frames. You need to be able to have quality of service. You need to be able to have dedicated bandwidth. 
on all of these things, and particularly around broadcast and ingest. But we're seeing this change happen now as we're seeing this move to an IP network and moving it to the cloud. So whereas previously we had these dedicated hardware switches, now we're using general purpose switches and general purpose servers, but we're now controlling them through software, through controllers such as Open Daylight. And this is, I think, again, this kind of a big shift that's happening right now. And yet we want to be able, and this gives you simultaneously the same kind of a guarantee that you had once before, but now you get a much more flexible environment so that you can now deliver it in many different ways according to what the consumer wants to achieve. Classic example is home DVRs. I sort of like this because I think we can all relate to this. We probably all have had DVRs in our home with a, with a clock flashing on and off because we never could set it or whatever. And we had to record our video and we had to hope that we would see the disc fill up. And this w seems fine because it replaced our VCRs, which is what we had in the past. But now we're seeing these things move into the cloud. And there's a lot of very good reasons for why you want it up in the cloud. One, you're going to have an infinitely large disk. You don't have to worry about your disk filling up. Uh, from the service provider point of view, they don't have to keep all the separate videos for every single person there. They can actually find ways to be much more economical and just mark the fact that you bought that and not even be able to essentially store it for you individually, uh, given certain digital rights um, concerns around that. And they also then can be able to deliver it to you whether you're in your home or not. So this cloud-based delivery, I think, is something that we're seeing come on very strong because it provides customers advantage and advantages for the service providers as well. So this obviously now becomes a software model instead of the hardware model of the home DVR. And this is the kind of thing that we're seeing, so we want to be able to, to have these kinds of new services being able to deliver it in this kind of a framework. So when we do this, we start to see, again, some of the traditional functions that we would have in a video kind of pipeline turning into software. And here's where we're talking about are these kind of service containers that can be chained together. I just pressed something. There we go. And what you have to do now, so you're going to start hearing a lot of people talking about orchestration. Uh, orchestration is how do you bring up these services? How do you scale individual services? What if you have uh, all of a sudden the peak demand because of some event and you need to, to one of these services, expand that to have a, a much more a capacity for the increase in demand. And you need to be able to have workflow managers that can, that can move this through the system here. So in, in concert with that, then we're seeing something called Docker, Kubernetes, Mesos, CoreOS, this is the containerization of the world that we're seeing because developers now are finding emulating a, a computer by having a virtual machine is a very heavyweight thing to, to carry around. And it doesn't provide much advantage to the individual developer. It's nice because you can actually run a Windows machine on top of a Mac or anything else because we virtualize the computer. But when we actually have a, a simpler environment, we want to be able to talk about how do we package an application together and in the packaging of that application, be able to run that as a container anywhere you want to is something that's tremendously advantaged uh, for the new application developer. So I think we're seeing these new models now of developers of, of how we develop applications come about to enable these new kinds of services and increase, again, the, the speed of service delivery. And for that reason, I want to then turn it over at this time to Ken Owens to talk about what Cisco is doing also in terms of now containers. There is many people, and I think that Jonathan even in his keynote uh, mentioned that some people think of cloud computing and containers as being at kind of war with each other, or that you have to choose between virtual machines and containers. Um, my view is it's a lot more nuanced than that. In fact, that we're going to see all these things together. What we're talking about, particularly with OpenStack, is, is the orchestration and the management of virtualized resources. And whether that be a container running on a virtual machine or a container running on bare metal, because in OpenStack we can or also orchestrate bare metal, it all becomes a single kind of plane that we can talk about as this new kind of cloud platform. And so the age of like sort of debating whether it's a container or a virtual machine really becomes one of a developer choice. Whatever they would like to be able to develop, and that's what we need to be able to support. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Thanks, Lou. So when 
you kind of think about what Lou was just describing. Why do you need a new model, right? I think it's not really so much a new model. It's just kind of making OpenStack the platform that OpenStack was designed to be. And so I kind of look at this from two different areas, right? There's disruption happening in the enterprise where you're looking at how do you move from kind of agile, how do you move to agile development from your traditional waterfall type of development? How do you start developing these cloud components as services, as Lou was referring to? Um, it's, it's kind of a natural evolution, I think, from a developer standpoint to look at, here's how I like to develop my services. How do I deploy these as services? And, and so it's, it's not much of a change from a developer standpoint. From an infrastructure standpoint, you want to offer services. And so OpenStack is a nice platform that allows you to create services and, and expose those services through APIs. And so it's a good fit between the two. Um, there's also this model of, you know, like Lou was referring to, how do you determine if you want virtual machines or bare metal or some other in-between solution, right? And I think most developers don't care, right? They just want to get their application out as fast as they can. They want to get it some feedback and they want to be able to modify and update their application based on the feedback they get from the market. And so kind of doing this hybrid DevOps where you can develop your application the way you develop it today, deploy it into an OpenStack cloud, see how the performance of that application is, tweak the application performance to improve the performance, um, modify the underlying infrastructure if you need to to provide better performance. Um, it's kind of what I call this hybrid DevOps model. The other thing that we're seeing is um, digital disruption is definitely impacting a lot of enterprises today. And so how do you kind of look at your, your infrastructure as a platform instead of as a set of, of compute and network and storage and security constraints, right? Um, how do you kind of look at the commoditization of infrastructure, which is probably not the best thing for your business in the end if you're on low quality, low grade hardware? How do you really differentiate your service in the marketplace if you, you're building it on top of a bunch of you know, basic commodity hardware? Um, the other thing is around security and privacy. So containerization in and of itself is not secure. But when you look at adding security and network capabilities to containers, you can have a much more secure and a much lower thought domain when you deploy things as services. So just you know, a couple quick asides in terms of what developers in the enterprise are telling us. Um, there's sort of two camps. You have your cloud native guys that are either developing today for the cloud or for mobile, or, you, or the traditional app developers moving to cloud native. And you have your data scientists that are looking at how do they take the analytics that are going to help them make real-time business decisions based on the application. So the analytics guys are concerned more about structured data versus unstructured data and how you collect that, um, kind of more like a Kubernetes model. The cloud native guys are more interested in continuous delivery and, and mobile first development, more of the Mesos scheduling model. And then enterprise IT is sort of stuck in the middle of the two, and, and they don't really understand either one that well yet. They will, but right now they're kind of like, scheduling, what's that? You know, I don't need to schedule. I'm more worried about how I provide security and governance and how do I connect you into my support systems. Um, and they're still trying to figure out how to support DevOps or work in a DevOps model. And so when you think about these three different you know, user groups, I kind of think of them in terms of personas, right? And so you have your developers at, are sort of the number one persona I think about the most. And they're really interested in how do I get this application from concept to production as quick as I can, and not understanding under anything about the underlying infrastructure as their mindset. Um, you have the IT admins who want to kind of create environments that can be consumed as a service. And they're trying to create this environment that the dev developers are going to leverage to take their application from concept to production. And then there's a few other you know, personas you can think about, like the CIO and the business owner. but. If you focus on the developer and the admin two use cases, you hit most of the use cases that the CIO and the business owner care about. And then what do they want to do? They want to basically build their application, deploy that application, and then run it. And so when you think about the build piece, um, I think most of the philosophy in the, in, in the developer environment today is don't make me or ask me to change how I like to develop. So I, I have a framework I develop in, I have platforms I like to use, just let me continue to develop the way I like to develop. From a deploy standpoint, right now, if you think about the biggest issue I think facing you know, OpenStack and other clouds today is that you have to write to those specific APIs. And as Lou mentioned in his earlier conversation, um, the latest version of code is the most stable. 
And so if you are writing to OpenStack, you have to write to the latest version of OpenStack. Every six months, you're changing your code or potentially changing your code. No, you're not always changing it, but more than likely, you're going to have to change your code or at least validate your code again. And so when you think about how do you kind of develop your code once and then just kind of deploy it in a CI CD model afterwards, that's sort of the layer that we can write above OpenStack. Earlier, Lou called it the sandwich, right? So we're kind of looking at above the top part of the sandwich. How do we kind of create a platform um, interface that allows you to kind of write your code to interface with not just OpenStack, but other cloud technologies. And that's something we call Mantle. Uh, Mantle.io is the website. And then from a run standpoint, um, most developers want to understand how their applications and those services they depend on are performing and behaving. And so creating a, a run environment that lets you from a single interface look at how your application is performing across multiple clouds, across multiple services, is a, is a key part of the framework. And then tying in some of the application intent policy stuff from APIC and from other um, controllers in the environment in Tosca, being able to give you a single in interface that lets you look at your application um, from one console versus multiple consoles is a key part of, of the interface. And that's what we call Project Shipped. And so Project Shipped is a curated experience. Um, it's available at Shipped.io, um, Cisco Shipped.io. Um, it's tied in with these components you see today, so we're trying to hit the um, kind of the beginning part of the development cycle, letting developers develop the way they like to develop with GitHub integration. Um, we have build packs for the most popular code um, in use today, also Eclipse. Um, we're using Vagrant to kind of run in a local IDE on your laptop, which is what most developers do anyway. We're adding OpenShift and um, Cloud Foundry support in the next release of um, Project Shipped. We're using um, Drone for CI CD today, as well as um, Terraform to kind of give you an abstraction layer um, that lets you run across multiple clouds. And so today we support Amazon and Google, um, DigitalOcean, uh, Cisco's Cloud, Cisco's MetaCloud, and um, along with Rackspace and VMware Cloud. So it's completely abstracting the underlying infrastructure so you don't have to worry about writing to specific infrastructure APIs. Although we don't completely hide them. And so if you wanted to write you know, to an APIC controller, we let you write directly to an APIC controller as well. So we, we're kind of giving you the, a choice of taking the abstraction layer and not having to understand the underlying infrastructure. Or if you want to really write to the underlying infrastructure, we'll give you access to the underlying infrastructure APIs as well. From the orchestration and scheduling standpoint, we're supporting both Mesos, uh, Marathon, Zookeeper, and Kubernetes. Um, so we're giving you a choice of all of those. We use console to give you name Names, um, namespace and tie it into DNS, so each container gets an IP address. Um, you can route between containers and your services, so it's uh, making network and security like a, a key aspect of every container. And then from the service assurance side, we're adding a lot of data analytics pieces that are being asked for by the data scientist community. So things like Elk, the Elk stack is, in, is included, Logstash for, and Zoom data for kind of an, an analyzing and understanding the different log inputs of your application, and then like Elasticsearch to give you, you know, the searchability of that of that data. So, we think about what Mantle really is. It's trying to give you that glue that every project has to kind of use today to to kind of build their application. Um, it's an end to end batteries included solution. It's designed from, from day one to kind of give you all the different components of the open source community in an integrated manner. Um, it's an extensible, so as new components come out, we'll be able to add those components in very easily. It's an open source um, initiative within Cisco. Um, it's on GitHub at um, Microservices Infrastructure and Mantle.io if you want to get to it directly from the website. Um, and what we're really doing is just basically taking what every enterprise developer is doing today on their own per team, per project. And so instead of having to kind of build a platform from scratch every time, we're kind of giving you a, a basic infrastructure, a microservices infrastructure as a service, if you will, that can run inside the data center and it can be deployed across any external cloud. The architecture is pretty simple. It's um, basically we have control nodes and resource nodes. The control nodes give you the basic, you know, um, scheduling services around um, how you set DNS up, how do you manage your resources, how do you manage your namespace. The resource nodes let you do the 
on um, the local um, destination scheduling. We run it in a single data center environment and we can run across multiple data centers, which is sort of the, the key thing that we focused on with Mantle. Um, and today, I guess we support multiple clouds. The, um, the key thing I want to get to was the networking piece that was mentioned earlier. And so to us, networking is not just, not just because with Cisco is important, but networking is always important for any application, right? And so um, we've been able to make it a first class citizen of containers. Um, today it runs, each container has its own IP address. Um, we, we seamlessly integrate with different um, networking protocols and can support BGP across the different container spaces. Um, we have basically created a unified platform for, for networking across Kubernetes and workloads um, consuming Meso services. And from a policy standpoint, we are releasing in the next few weeks with working with Congress we're doing here in OpenStack, uh, we have a blueprint available to kind of let you do application policy intent, which basically takes the whole definition of your application from a set of like specific requests to more of a, I would like to have high CPU, or I need better networking, or I need better security, making it very simple to kind of define what you are looking for, what you care about the most, and then we can provide the best solution underneath the covers to support that. So actually, I, we wanted to leave some time for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please make your way up to the microphone. But, but actually, Ken, I had, I had one question, which is that if we look back at, for example, the shipped uh, diagram, you've got very, very large number of open source systems that are there. Yep. Uh, that must be a huge learning um, <laughs> challenge for many of the developers. And right. have you, in, in your working with different developers developing these microservices, how do they keep up with all of that? There's a lot of different right. things that they have to learn. Yeah, they, they, they don't do a great job of keeping up with all the different open source projects. <laughs> um, and you think about OpenStack is a, a, a lot of open source projects within itself, right? So when you, when you add the infrastructure pieces, you try to figure out all the um, integrations to the back office and to the support systems that an, an IT enterprise has to support, they, they are really struggling to do this every single release. And really? so trying to provide a single platform that is above the stack, right, and integrating into different stacks that are below that API interface, mm -hmm. they, they are very excited about being able to just leverage something that's open. Right. We're not locking them into any one technology. We're not forcing them like down a the path. that's the first decision that they're making. Yeah. Are they going to be working above OpenStack at the application layer where they actually are creating the new microservices and everything else? Right. And therefore, there's a whole lot of tooling that they have to learn there which looks very familiar to the tooling that OpenStack developers see. It's all right. GitHub and Garrett and everything else like exactly. that. Exactly. But it's done at that application layer. And they don't have to worry about what's, what's, what's actually running the platform exactly. itself. Yep. But I think that whether it's, it's Whether it's OpenStack yeah. on bare metal, OpenStack on a, you know, a KVM, mm -hmm. or it's you know, AMIs, it, it, to the developer, they really don't want to think about that. They just want to write the code, publish it, get the feedback from the community as fast as they can on how well their application meets their business needs right. and then make changes from that. Because again, they're, they're in the business to make money for their company, not in the business to make OpenStack better, right? Right, right, <laughs> so. right, right, right. In fact, we should make just mention of two other OpenStack projects related to containers, which is Magnum and Cola. Yep. Uh, and how does, how does what we're doing with Mantle work with, with Magnum, for example, which is the, the way that we are deploying containers. Yeah, so we've been that. working really closely with Magnum, and we have two contributors on the Magnum project. Mm -hmm. And so we're, it's tied in very closely, but we're, again, we're kind of, that's one implementation that we're trying yep. to support, but there's others that we also support okay. with Magnum. Yeah, just, just in terms of the audience, though, so Magnum is a project um, in part of a big tent uh, for OpenStack, whereby we can, you can bring up Kubernetes, you can bring up Mesos, and it's designed to be able to deliver now in this latest release or whatever, through even Horizon, you can yep. start to bring up now this cluster that you need to of these containers. And so immediately the, the developer who's only interested in working at the container level can do that. And that can be run either on virtual machines or on bare metal node through Ironic as well. Yep. So we're seeing now, again, that usage of containers for microservices sitting on top of OpenStack, which can then support both virtual machines and containers. Because in a, in particularly, I think, then the, the individual customer gets to make the choice there. If they are actually want isolation between all of the tenants, they perhaps need to run containers on top of virtual machines where we have the isolation, the multi-tenancy provided by, by, the, by the hypervisors. 
whereby if they are essentially running as a single tenant with lots of projects, lots of applications, lots of services, they can start to think about using bare metal, yep. using Ironic to, to run Magnum as well. Exactly. Nice. Any other questions from the audience? Gary, how are we doing on time? Okay, well then, uh, we'll be up here if you want to ask any further questions, but if not, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Lou and Ken, and we invite you to come down to the Cisco booth in the marketplace. We're in space P3. Come on down, continue the conversation, ask questions. We'll be there, as the comedians would say, we'll be there all week. So come on down, we'll see you there. Thank you very okay. much, everybody. Thank you.